it's great to be here. Hello. Um, and yes, in case you got lost in Lisbon, as you heard, here are my contact details. Just get in touch. Um, I'm really happy to be here today to talk about the work that we do in the user experience team at Google. We are the people behind the apps that many of you will be familiar with, Google Maps, Google Search, and others. I've been in my job for about 10 years now, a bit over a decade. And today, I want to give you a glimpse behind the scenes. How do we decide on new features to build? How do we get inspiration for new designs? And most importantly, how do we understand our users? Now, before I talk about work, I really want to give you a bit of a perspective into my background and into my story to really see what uh, shaped my perspective today. I grew up in the Black Forest um, in a small village in the south of Germany. Um, it's beautiful there, a lot of trees, but not much else to do. So in the late 90s, when the Berlin Wall came down, as soon as I could, as soon as I finished high school, I moved to Berlin because the city had become a magnet for artists, creatives, and a, almost a laboratory for experimentation. So I did enroll in art school, and that was a truly uh, tremendous time. But also in the 90s, in the late 90s, the internet boom happened. Uh, so I moved to London to uh, do a PhD in computer science because I wanted to get deeper into engineering and technology. Now, with that background, it's not very surprising that I ended up in Silicon Valley in the 2000s. I joined a small startup at the time called Google. People are still getting around campus on these funny colored bikes. And this background really gave me a pretty good perspective that was important for my job uh, over the last 10, 12 years because I had small town, big city experience. I lived in Germany, the UK, and the US. But most importantly, I had one foot in the creative field in design and the other one in engineering. And that gave me a lot of empathy for my colleagues in these different fields and also a lot of empathy for our users. Now, that's enough about me. Let's look at Google's journey um, to see what how our early experiences have really shaped our outlook and our values today. Google was founded in 98 by two PhD students at Stanford University, Larry and Sergey. We just celebrated our 20th birthday, actually, in September this year. Here they are um, in Susan Wojcicki's garage. Uh, Susan is still with us. She now runs YouTube. But as you can see, our beginnings were pretty humble. In fact, Larry and Sergey built their first data, our first data center from Lego blocks. Now, while the surroundings were humble, um, there was also very early focus on engineering excellence. Speed and reliability was really important to the early founding team from day one. Now, what's probably not as well known is that there was a big focus on the user as well. What you see behind me is the first entry in our founding charter, the 10 things we know to be true. And that's not just an empty statement. It really is something that the company lived by. And if you think about it, the focus on speed is really there to allow users to get to the information they need as quickly as possible. And similarly, uh, simplicity, our design from the very early days, the big white homepage with the single search box, that simplicity also was there to make sure that nothing gets into the way of the user finding the information that they need. There's another aspect, and this is a story Marissa Meyer, one of the first engineers at Google, told me. In the very early days, the founding team would get together, go to a basement room in Stanford University, and do user tests. They would show prototypes to people, see how they react, ask questions, and then improve based on that. So from the very early days, user focus and simplicity was really in the DNA, in our cultural roots. And that translated a few years later, 2006, when I joined the company, into considerable investment in usability labs. And what you see here are these usability labs. Simulated office environments with desktop computers, windowless, artificial light, fake plant in the corner. I spent a lot of time in my early days in these labs. And what we would do is we would test products just before they would be released uh, with people who would often live nearby the office. 
and again to get feedback and to improve the usability of these products. Now, if you look at my super simple product development path here, uh, all of our user focus, all of our energy was very much at the end of the product development cycle. So we learned a lot, we improved the products, but there was very little scope to really change the, the, the overall roadmap of the product. Now, let's fast forward. 2009 is when I took over leading user research for Google Maps. And the first challenge or problem that landed in my lap was improving wayfinding and driving directions. Remember, in those days, navigation was often something that we did by looking up routes on our desktop computers and then taking them with us. So this is how driving directions looked in India roughly in 2009. You don't need to be an expert to see that that is not ideal. So what did we do? We had all these usability labs, but it seemed wrong to study wayfinding seated at a desk in a room. So what we did instead, we went out to the streets and the cities of Northern Europe, uh, of North America, Europe, and Asia. What you see here is a team that we took to, uh, to India to do wayfinding studies uh, out on a bus here uh, with us. Importantly, we didn't just take the UX team, but we took our partners in engineering and product management. So the entire team went through this experience. And this is how Google Maps in India a few months later looked. Obviously, we added street names. But you might know from your own experience that street names are not that useful when you are navigating. Street signs might be obscured, or streets might go by multiple names. When you give directions to someone, you might, might say, say something like, OK, go down the street, at the tram stop, turn right, walk towards the church. You're using landmarks when you're giving directions to people. And that's exactly what we did as well, what you see here. In these results, we added confirmation landmarks so people would know that they're still on the right path as they are moving on their path to give them comfort and reassurance. This was a long time ago. Of course, navigation has moved on. We now navigate with our phones largely. But this first project gave us a taster for the power of really doing immersion research, being with users out in the cities, out in their homes. Over the years, we've done many, many more of these projects. But last year, in 2017, we took a slightly different turn. We took not just the product team that creates these products, but we took our executives as well, the strategy decision makers. And we just took them out into the streets of Delhi and Mumbai and had them find their way with Google Maps and local apps and use cars, mopeds, rickshaws, be on foot. Many of them duly got lost but they certainly had very memorable experiences. Now, importantly, we did this just before our annual strategy planning cycle. So everyone came back to our headquarters with these memories and deep and meaningful experiences, and then they went into the planning cycle. Let's see what came out of this. Last year in December, we launched Google Maps Go, which is uh, a Google Maps uh, version that we launched in India first and have since rolled it out to other countries as well. One of the most prominent features in this app is two-wheeler navigation. And if you think about it, in these mega cities, it's often much faster to get around on a moped because you can take routes that are different from the routes that cars can take. And we have now support for this, for this navigation mode. We have at the moment about 20 million active users and we are continuing to roll this out to other cities. Here's another example, Google Go, which is a search app that we've built in a very similar fashion. You can instantly see that this app looks different from how Google search typically looks. You will notice that there's a lot more tap targets, and it makes sense to have those on a mobile phone because typing can be difficult. You can just tap on these. But it's also important for users that may have low literacy or who don't quite know yet what can be found on the internet who are new to the internet. Uh, this app, again, was built in close collaboration with our users. We built about 30 different prototypes, and we tested them in India, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Nigeria, <laughs> Kenya, Vietnam, and the Philippines. So pretty global, thorough uh, testing. And importantly, we didn't do this just in usability labs, but again, in people's homes and out in the streets of the cities and, and villages that people live in. Now, 
later this year, then, we launched another feature. We uh, introduced uh, a technique for having the websites read back to you. Again, if you're on the go, this makes a lot of sense because you can listen to the web results rather than uh, just read them. But again, it's very important for users with low literacy. And again, this was inspired by direct contact and conversation with our users. Coming back to my super simple product development uh, timeline, at the very beginning, our user focus was on usability at the end of the development process. And we have now, over the years, really stretched this out. So we are now testing with users, getting inspiration at all stages of the development process. And importantly, as you can see here, often the inspiration for new concepts and new products does come from these field visits and from these immersion trips that we are taking. Now, it's been great to see this change internally, but what makes me really happy also is to see more and more external recognition for this. Uh, earlier this year, I went to the AIGA award ceremony in New York, and Google was recognized as a leader in design excellence. Just a few months back, Fast Company also named Google as a, um, as a leader in, in, in design. So I do think there is quite a perception change now from engineering excellence also to design excellence uh, for the, in the company. Now, I want to change tack a bit because you might be thinking, well, doing all these global trips for inspiration and building products is great if you're a global company, but what do I do with my startup or what do I do if I'm an agency? We do a lot of local work as well, and let me take you through a couple of examples here. Remember those windowless labs that, we've, that I've shown you earlier? Well, we've taken them and put them on a van, added some windows, and are driving this van around Silicon Valley now. We are taking, again, our colleagues in engineering, product management, marketing, on half-day trips to get outside the Silicon Valley bubble, to connect with communities, and to do these user tests one or two or three hours away from, color, from our headquarter. And Again, these trips create real inspiration for real product changes. Here's an example that we launched earlier this year. We have a new commute experience now, and I'm sure many of you commute every day, so you will understand that depending on whether you live in a village, in suburbia, or in, a, uh, in the city center, your commute will be different. So we've taken the van and have driven to all these different communities to get different perspectives for our product develop development for, for our commute experience. And amongst the features that we've added, one is park and ride. We have now support for commute journeys that require you to drive to a train station, park your car, and then take the train um, to, a, uh, to a different location. Uh, the feature that I'm most happy about is that we have now playlist integration for navigation. Commutes can be really long. If you're driving, you want to listen to music. But it can be hard to control your music when you're in navigation mode. So now we have the controls integrated in, in your navigation experience so you have a better overall experience. Again, this came out of conversations with our users as we did uh, these research trips with the van. There's another way in which we can get global perspectives without anyone moving. What you see here is a map of my team locations. And uh, recently, we started a design sprint in New York, in our New York office. We wanted to kick off some new ideas for how the results page on Google Search could look. Uh, at the end of the Monday, we packed up all the ideas, all the whiteboarding sketches, and sent them to our team in India who then on their Tuesday morning did some quick informal user studies and feedback sessions. And at the end of their day, they sent it back to New York. And on Tuesday morning, we could continue with our design sprint with local insights from, from a global user base. Again, it doesn't require you to have teams all over the globe. You can do this with working with local agencies or using simple tools such as video conferencing. Here's what came out of this. Um, we have now a new results experience for exam entry results. That's really important in countries like India or Brazil, where there's millions of students taking national standard exams, and it can be really difficult to get essential information on the web. And our results experience is now optimized for these students to get really important information about their exams. Now, the subtitle of this talk was Creativity Through Empathy. And I've given you a lot of examples of how we've learned 
by being with people, by seeing how they live, how doing their daily commutes or parts of their daily lives. Now, I have one admission to make because very often when we go on these trips, we already have an inkling as to what we might be finding. We have this from surveys, from metrics, or just from our own intuition. So you might be asking, why on earth go through all this effort, all this expenditure to do these team trips to, to build our products? Well, it has to do with our culture. And we sometimes half-jokingly refer to Google having a Montessori culture. You might be familiar, uh, you might even have a child uh, in a Montessori school. Maria Montessori revolutionized education with a few principles. And what you see here is a very simple summary of these principles. But to go through them, education should be based on learning in context rather than only in the, in the classroom, learning with peers rather than only from an instructor. And then most importantly, from my point of view, uh, creating your own eureka moments, creating your own insights rather than just learning pre-existing theories and concepts. So if you step back and think how we've organized design research at Google, we've taken actually, without knowing, many of these principles to heart. We send our teams out into the field. We have them observe and study and learn together with their colleagues. And most importantly, we help them have their own eureka moments because that generates the insights and the energy that drives change. I would argue that Google's culture is very uh, well suited to this approach because we generally have a culture where we learn from our own mistakes. We don't want just to port in best practices. There's generally encouragement to, to learn by doing. Then on the design team in particular also, we don't have one head of design that approves all ideas. It's very democratic and innovation is very spread out. Good ideas can come from everywhere and taking this approach allows the seeds for these ideas to, um, to get sown. So while I think it works very well at Google, it's also a very human approach. And I do think it is something that you can port in some form or another to many other environments and many other companies. I mentioned Eureka moments. One, one program we kicked off last year um, that I'm really happy about is um, us creating Eureka moments for thousands of our colleagues. Uh, we have so far have run this program with about 2,000 and more are to come. What we do in these sessions, we are reconnecting with this early spirit of the, I think, yeah, I mentioned earlier the, the Stanford basement user studies that were done by the founding team. We want to reconnect with that spirit. And we have now thousands of our colleagues meet their users and learn from them in direct observation. We do this in our offices, so there's no travel required. It doesn't take much time. It's pretty easy. I've run many of these sessions myself, and they're still to this day some of the most gratifying and satisfying experiences of my, of my career. Because you, what happens usually is you get 20, 30 colleagues into the room, and they might be a bit uh, reluctant and skeptical because they feel, well, I know my product really well. What, what can I learn from this session? Um, and then we bring them together with the user and we ask the users to teach back the product to our colleagues so that they can learn their perspective. They can see how it works for them, how it fits into their lives or not. And what usually happens halfway through these sessions, the energy flips entirely, you know, where there's doubt and questions at the beginning. At the end of these sessions, everyone is so eager to share their insights because they have had their worldview changed. They will have new insights, and it's not just abstract insights, but something that's tied to a person that they've spent one or two hours with. And it's this momentum for change that really uh, we are trying to build, and that has helped us move uh, a lot of these, uh, of these changes forward. Now, stepping back a bit, um, many of the um, programs and, and efforts that I've shown you are part of a broader uh, initiative in the company, and this goes well beyond the design and the user experience team. It's a product excellence initiative, and this includes marketing, HR, learning and development. It's really a company-wide effort. And one of the goals of this effort is to reconnect us with this uh, early DNA as sim uh, symbolized in these, in these uh, founding team uh, user studies. What you see here is a, the very high level summary of uh, our product excellence principles. And we've created these over multiple iterations in many conversations across all the functions in the company. 
And we now have a shared understanding, a shared language, and a common bar that we hold ourselves accountable to, independent of which function you are in. Uh, we are also working with our learning and development team to make sure that we have onboarding materials and trainings so that these principles are really translated to actions across the company. Importantly, there's also some bite to this because we've worked with our HR team to make sure that our promotion guidelines are updated. So if you want to get promoted, you have to show that your work adheres to these principles or furthers these principles. Uh, you can see a simple design, intuitive design. These are things you probably feel Google is known for already, and we definitely want to double down on those as well. So this brings me to my last slide. Uh, and I do think this quote by Peter Drucker really sums up quite nicely what I've learned over the last 10 years leading design research at Google. Our technologies change. When I joined Google, mobile was the hot new thing. Uh, now it's assistive technologies, AI, machine learning, conversational design, and more changes will come. Our user base is shifting as well. And of course, Google itself is changing. We were 5,000 people when I joined. Now we are 90,000. The one thing that remains constant, though, and this is really important, is our cultural roots, our focus on simplicity and on the user. And it's just a matter of translating and adjusting for each stage of our journey and to reinterpret and make this real. And that's been the journey that I've been on. And with that, I'd like to close. Thank you for, for listening. Please get in touch, and I'm happy to continue the conversation.